Good morning. I'm going to uh, pick up from where I left off at Closure West um, back in April, talking about the uh, developments in our Pamela system and language. Um, this is approximately what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, start off by uh, trying to situate what we're doing. I know I've run into a lot of people here already who were at Closure West, but not everyone, so I want to make sure everyone knows what we're doing and why and what the philosophy is. Then I'm going to talk about part of the uh, learning that involves transitions. And then I'm going to pass the baton over to one of my colleagues and we will have a, a short demonstration. Um, the, the primary team consists of, uh, of five of us, uh, four of whom are here today. Um, the one who's missing, Dr. Hoffman, um, has been doing a lot of work in deep learning and uh, maybe we'll come back to another uh, closure conference to show some of those results. Um, so I wanted to start off by giving a little history of the, uh, of the idea. Um, Pamela is a descendant of a, a long string of languages um, and we've, we've taken things from these listed antecedents, um, particularly um, the MPL, RMPL uh, train of, of languages. These date back um, quite a way to Xerox Park and then to, uh, to NASA where they were actually deployed in LISP on a spacecraft in 2001 in the Deep Space One experiment in which the spacecraft ran for a period of time um, autonomously using this technology written in LISP and um, was able to, uh, among other things, diagnose faults that were injected into the system. Um, since then, um, the uh, technology has largely disappeared into academia where there are various groups around the world um, con continuing these ideas, but the, uh, the tools all belong to these little isolated groups and there's really nothing available to anyone who wanted to try and deploy these ideas. So part of our goal here um, for which we uh, obtained DARPA funding was to take this set of ideas, um, not as is though, we added a uh, the dimension of machine learning into the equation and to make this an open source project so that these capabilities are available to the world because it's time to start deploying them here on Earth, not, not only in space. So um, those of you who don't know um, RMPL or MPL, it's a modeling language. It lets you model uh, systems, cyber-physical systems, for example, like a spacecraft. Um, the, th the primary thing that we're bringing to the table is adding in support for machine learning. Um, machine learning has now become essential. The, the way we build applications today um, involve interacting with the real world. I'm talking about robots, I'm talking about um, the Amazon Echo, I'm talking about all of these applications that deal, interact with human beings or with the, the world at large. And these kind of systems um, need to be able to deal with unexpected circumstances, need to deal with um, vision and human language. And all of these applications, the, the key to success in these kind of interface with reality is machine learning and there's a, a great amount of work done on machine learning. It's not that um, well used outside of research groups because it requires a fair amount of expertise. So part of the philosophy here is that we should make machine learning so that you don't have to be a machine learning expert to use it. What you need to be an expert in is, is modeling, describing your system um, for which machine learning is necessary and that if the modeling language has sufficient expressivity, we can um, integrate the machine learning automatically. The second idea is that machine learning has often been um, a side project. The machine learning piece is done on the side. They collect some data, you churn around for a few hours, maybe for a few days to learn it. And then you extract the magic numbers and put them into your program which you then ship that doesn't have any machine learning in it whatsoever. Uh, part of philosophy here is that machine learning 
belongs in the application and it should continue to, to learn while it's in operation. So I want to show you a little bit about um, one of the aspects that um, is working quite well right now. And we have a long list of things. I already mentioned deep learning, which I'm not going to speak much about today. Uh, I'm going to focus on a, a simpler form of learning, um, but I hope it, it makes the point. So the rectangle depicts what a Pamela program is. It's divided into two parts. There's the part that models the plant, and when I'm talking about the plant, so the plant sometimes is a piece of hardware. It might be a spacecraft, it might be a robot, it might be, um, um, a, it might be a power station, some phys cyber physical system that we want to have some control over and have some observability of. We need to describe what that plant is at the level of abstraction suitable for our goals. The Pamela control program allows us to make that plant do something. Rather than just watch it, we can actually uh, cause it to do things like uh, for a robot, we might want it to go from A to B, for example. So we can divide the Pamela model into these two basic parts. The control program goes through a, a system that can um, manage the unrolling of a control program with the real plant. The red line here depicts the barrier between the Pamela program and the plant, whether that plant can be a robot, a, a real physical thing, or it can actually be another software thing. There's not that much difference these days. Um, if you're communicating with something over the network, it uh, takes on many of the uh, forms of a cyber physical system, even though it doesn't have any physical counterpart. On the other side, the, uh, the Pamela model uh, enables us to interpret the state of observations that come from the plant. It's in the context of its model that the observations from the plant make sense. And those can be used in conjunction with the control program to appropriately uh, control the robot. So if the robot has to be at a particular place and observations that we're getting from the robot are where it is, then that makes part of the control of moving the robot to the right place. That was all that I described at Closure West. Um, but as I said, the, the key magic source here is learning algorithms. So if we add on to that um, learning algorithms, given the model of the plant, we can automatically extract from that what it is that is learnable and invoke the appropriate learning algorithms, which have been uh, integrated in a way to detect their applicability to, to things in the model. I'll, I'll make this, I'll give a clear example in a moment. Observations that come from the plant now not only go into the uh, um, state estimation box, but also are uh, streamed they, they get stored in a database. We, we happen to be using MongoDB here, but we could use any database suitable of storing uh, of JSON. And those observations are then available for the learning algorithms. The learning algorithms then don't have to be separated from the application. The application is continuously generating these observations. The learning algorithms, by virtue of the plant model, know how to interpret the observations and can do the, apply the learning algorithms as needed, and they can put back into the database what it is that they've learned, and those things can be fed into the uh, plant state interpretation box. So that's, that's essentially the vision of what a Pamela-enabled application looks like. There's whatever it is below the red line, which we have some amount of control over and some amount of observability of, but much of it is hidden. It's a black box except for a well-defined interface, and we have a model that encapsulates what our knowledge is about the correct operation of that plant. All right, to start off, give a very simple example, um, a very typical example. It's simple, but also hard. It's hard in the sense that in real life, um, things tend to be easier than this because there are more constraints. Examples that are very simple tend to be less constrained and therefore uh, are good examples of uh, 
tests for machine learning. In this case, we consider the, the idea of coin tossing. When I toss a coin, it's considered to be fair because there are two sides and the likelihood of um, one or the other is even. But we all know that we can um, replace the coin with one that has two heads and then suddenly it's de decidedly not fair. And with die, we can, we can similarly weight the die so that the probability of certain numbers is higher than others. And if you know how it's weighted and you, you bet on it, you can win. Um, in this case, we consider the possibility of a weighted coin, one in which the probability of it um, giving a head is different from the probability of giving it a tail. And uh, we imagine a, toy, a coin tosser. And the rules of this game, I'm, I put the text in here largely for the benefit of the reader, but that's not you, that's for someone else in the future who wants to read the slide. I'm going to prefer to describe it this way. The, the coin tosser has two coins, a fair coin and a biased coin. And occasionally he changes which coin he's using. So you, you come up to his table, he, want, he wants to bet, he cos, tosses the fair coin a few times, and you see that it's fair, and then while you're not looking, he switches it for the biased coin, and then that's when he takes you to the cleaners. Um, in this case, we represent that um, as this state transition. The coin is either biased or unbiased, and um, in using these numbers, um, 0.9 is the probability of remaining with either the biased or the unbiased coin, but one time out of 10, it, he will switch coin to the other coin. So we, these numbers encapsulate the transitions between these two states encapsulate the idea of the probability of switching the coin. And then the, the emission probabilities are shown at the bottom. In the case of the unbiased coin, the probabilities are even. It's a fair coin. And in the case of the biased coin, there's something else. And we can change what those something else's are, where they should add up to one. So it's a, a, a standard problem and very simple. The idea here, of course, is that the person playing the game can see the heads and the tails that get flipped, but he has no idea which coin is being tossed. And part of what we are trying to do here is to estimate what the hidden state is. The hidden state here is which coin is being used. So if you see a sequence, a sequence of heads of, or tails, can you determine approximately when he switched the coin? The answer is yes, and there are machine learning algorithms to do that, and here's how we can model that. Those of you who didn't uh, see my uh, excruciating explanation of the syntax in April, I think this shouldn't be too hard to, to follow anyway. Um, Def P class introduces a Pamela class. Um, here we have um, a class that represents the values head and tail. This is um, what can be face up after a toss. Um, and then we have the coin class, which might have been called the, the tosser or the player, um, because he's either tossing with the biased coin or the unbiased coin. So he has these two modes. The, the fair coin tossing or the unfair coin tossing. Now, what observations do we get? As I said, the only observation we get is, is a face up. We get to see what faces up after he's tossed the coin, but we certainly don't see him switch the coin. That's what we're, we're trying to estimate here. So the uh, the diagram here that showed the transitions between biased and unbiased are represented straightforwardly in transitions here. These are names, biased, unbiased. Uh, the precondition that it's biased and the postcondition is that it's unbiased. And the, the question is, what is the probability of that switch? Um, we don't know because we haven't learned it yet. But we can estimate that if it's biased, it's probably uh, going to switch um, about 0.15 of the time. The probability of a switch is about 0.15. These numbers don't have to be correct. They're, they're input from the engineer, from the, the person who wrote the program. 
a lot of learning algorithms work well if you can seed them in approximately the right region, and then the, con the learning converges faster. So we have these four. These numbers aren't the same ones used in the, in the diagram, um, but they will converge to whatever is real uh, as it learns. Now in this case, the plant that we built was in software. It has, uses a random number generator and the program has real numbers fixed in it for what the transition probabilities are and what the emission probabilities are. And by using the call to a random number generator, it respects those. And then the learning part has to learn those. The emissions are dealt with like this. Uh, we have a method called FLIP. Now FLIP is implemented in the plant. So it's a primitive method. So primitive true means that this method is implemented in the plant but we have a body for it, and the body describes our model of that thing that's in the plant. And the model is that the first choice, if, if it's in biased mode, then it's going to choose a head with probability um, 0.82. This is the emission uh, from biased of a head. And this, again, is a, is a guesstimate of what that number would be. And the LVAR indicates that this is a learning variable. So the, the code that invokes automatically learning algorithms searches for where the learning variables are, and based on the structure of the problem, decides what learning algorithms are appropriate. Similarly, we have the probability of a tail if we're biased, and the and the same things for the unbiased case. So then we need it to train. We don't actually have to do anything for it to train if the thing just runs by itself. If we had a human who was doing the tossing and we were just monitoring it, then we would get the observations of heads, heads, tails, tails, and so on. Those observations would get dumped into the database. When there were enough of them, the uh, Baum Welsh learning algorithm in this case would be invoked. It would learn the probabilities, and then it would be able to um, indicate when it thinks the coin has been switched based on those learned probabilities using um, the Viterbi algorithm in this case. What algorithms are involved depends on the structure, of course, of the model. In this case, in order to force the plant to flip the coins, we have this, this simple control program the flip sequence, which um, a thousand flips the coin a thousand times. That simply flips it with the flipping, observations come in, they get stored, and then the, the learning automatically takes place. And later on, it will be able to tell us when it thinks the coin has been exchanged. That would be a useful thing to know if we were betting that we think that he's changed the coin because the last few ones were last few flips were rather improbable for a uh, for a, a fair coin. So this is a this is a output of of a test, and the the top graph shows the ground truth. This is the plant actually telling us after the fact when it switched the coin, and the two graphs beneath it are when the learned version decided that the coins were fair or unfair. They're not identical, obviously. And of course, because it's, um, it's random, it's, it's not impossible to, to flip 10 heads in a row with a fair coin. It happens. So um, that's why I said this is, this is a particularly hard problem. However, it does amazingly well. Um, and the first, the middle graph shows using a sequence of a 1,000 flips to be able to say when these transitions occur. And the bottom one is where we're only looking at 100 data points. We can try it with different numbers of data points. And there's a good point there, because depending on how many points you use for training and how many points you use for observation to decide when flips occur affect parameters like timeliness of the um, observation or um, the accuracy with which the probabilities are learned. These are things that the designer might care about and be able to put in the program. And then the learning algorithm can attempt to achieve those levels of accuracy 
or um, levels of timeliness or make the appropriate trade-offs. So our goal here is to make it possible to write models, to specify what your requirements are, and to let the learning algorithms be selected um, and parameterized in order to meet those goals as best as is possible, perhaps with some hints here and there. This, the first, this set was where the uh, probability was 0.9 for heads and 0.1 for tails for the um, biased case. And this second one is where it's 0.8 for heads and 0.2 for tails. Um, as the probabilities come closer to being a fair coin, it becomes progressively more difficult. But at 0 0.8, 0 0.2, it still um, works well enough to make money on in a bet. And, but when you drop below 0.8, the, uh, the results start to deteriorate. But that's not our fault, because we're, we're not magicians. We're just integrating machine learning here and making it available to you. So something that's much simpler than that is the notion of temporal bounds. Often when we do something, we want to specify how long it's going to take if we um, a, a typical one in a, uh, in a space scenario is if you want to um, do a, an orbital insertion of a space probe, you need to fire the engines to reduce its speed as it gets to orbit. And that requires um, that you heat up the catalyst bed perhaps many hours ahead of reaching the orbit. So any plan that involves an orbital insertion has to involve turning on the catalyst bed heater hours before arrival at the planet in question. Otherwise, you're going to fly straight by it. So time durations are essential in cyber physical systems, not all of them, but in many of them. And often, it's essential in software systems too. How long is too long if you're trying to connect to a, a server uh, somewhere in the cloud? Or how long is too long to wait for a response for your uh, database query? Um, there are answers in there. And typically, um, people make them up. Here's an example here where we're turning something on. The bounds, if you see um, for the method, the method has a precondition and a postcondition, which we're not interested in right now. But the bounds between one and three milliseconds, that's how long the engineer thinks that this turn on will take. Now, this, this is pretty much. Um, the way these numbers generally come about. People have a notion of when is uh, an appropriate amount of time. But it turns out that if you know the real numbers, the programs are a lot more robust and a lot more useful. So we want to learn those numbers rather than have engineers simply make them up. So rather than just putting these numbers in here, which we can still do, by the way, if you insist on making your numbers up, but we can replace them with these learning variables that we showed in the previous example. Here we say that we're guessing that the, the lower bound for the turn on to be effective is one millisecond, and the upper bound is three. But we can learn these two variables. How do we do that? We, we simply record every time this turn on is performed, when it was started, and when it is completed. And after we've collected up enough of those, we can do statistics on it. We can find the mean, and we can define upper bound and lower bound as being plus or minus two standard deviations, for example. So these are, these are things where we can specify um, how we want to define upper and lower bound and have the system collect the data magically by itself, continue to retrain, because sometimes over the life of a switch it might um, it might uh, slow down from age. And we can have these numbers track the reality of the cyber-physical system as it goes. Um, this is very easy with, um, with the uh, observation catching and databasing um, architecture that I described at the beginning. I want to briefly talk a little bit about transitions, because transitions um, are what this is all about, and transitions are amazing things. And in fact, they're, they're largely underappreciated, and we can do a lot with them. So consider this example. This is an example of a, a car rolling down a hill um, and slightly back up the other hill. It could be formulated with an engine or without an engine. Um, it's defined in terms of um, three uh, differential equations. Um, this is a, 
the most simple imaginable rendering of these equations possible with a, a non-engine case. But we have a forward movement when uh, dx by dt is greater than zero, backward movement when it's less than zero, and when it's stationary at the bottom, its um, first and second derivatives are zero. But at some point, we have to transition between these, and interesting things happen when, when you transition. When you, when you go from moving forward to standstill, like when you come to a stop at a, at a traffic light, there's not just a, a simple switch between forward and stationary. Weird stuff happens. You, you will notice if you drive up to a traffic light and you put on your brake, that just at that point where you're about to stop, weird stuff starts to happen. The uh, parts of your car are still moving forward, but the wheels have stopped. So there's this, there's this little vibration that occurs in the car. Um, and that's really exciting stuff, because we can, we can measure that. If we had accelerometers in the car, they wouldn't measure that the car is stationary, even though the car is, because the wheels have now come to a standstill, but there's vibration occurring, and, um, and the accelerometers will register those movements back and forth, and we can do interesting stuff with that. So for example, look, here's uh, an interesting transition. A 25 volt battery um, connected up to, um, connected up to, um, uh, yeah, to, a, to say a motor. At the point of disconnection, there is a reverse EMF, this huge spike that goes down to in excess of minus 250 volts, which is very short-lived. And then there is the, the playing out of this, which goes on for about seven milliseconds. So once the motor is disconnected, thanks to the reverse EMF, there's seven milliseconds of interesting stuff going on. And there's other. Take a, a switch. If you disconnect a, uh, if you push a button, there's physical bounce. There's a physical process there. The, the connector actually makes and breaks contacts a large number of times before it settles down. I think this is in around five milliseconds duration in which where there's this noise. That's, that's pretty cool stuff. Usually we try to hide these things, make them go away. We can put a capacitor over it. We can use various damping things. We can choose not to sample it until a period has passed where we can e safely ignore it all. But uh, I'm claiming that ignoring it is the wrong thing. And then, of course, there's crosstalk. If you have one of these big spikes on one of your wires, that, that's 200, more than 250 volt spike. Um, that can be induced into nearby wires, and before you know it, you have, um, you, you, your, uh, your effect is no longer localized to one particular thing, but it, it spreads out. In particular, when you're making a transition, you don't necessarily know what you're transitioning to, but you might, this, the answer might be hidden in, these, uh, in this waveform. So, it turns out that Using our observation capturing mechanism, we can capture this waveform because every transition goes across the, the interface as an observation. We don't damp it out. We can learn how long it takes to die down. So we can learn what the bounds are. When, when does this period of weird stuff end? Because that's what the bound is for that, that button. When we say, when, when I said that it was between one and three milliseconds, maybe five milliseconds in this case, that's between when it's stably zero and when it's stably one. We can, Let's get to the demo. Let's yeah, the demo. We, can, we can learn those things and we can use deep learning to recognize these waveforms so that when a button press is happening, we can detect early on um, that a transition is happening and, and which one in particular. Now I, I want to pass over to my colleague to talk about the interface between uh, the Pamela system and the plants that it's controlling. Hello. So I'll give a brief introduction to what the plant interface is. And essentially, a plant interface uh, connects the, the smart components like uh, dispatcher, planner, to the physical components, which you'll see in a minute, uh, the cyber physical systems. 
essentially, it's a set of messages that go back and forth between the software components and the physical components. Uh, uh, you could view it as a remote procedure call, but there is a little bit more to it. Uh, there is a subtle difference that uh, I'll cover shortly. So there are a few messages uh, no, I, I, I'll briefly describe. The start message is sent by the uh, software system to send a command to the physical system, and the physical system acts it back with the started, and when the command is finished or failed, uh, the messages come back. Likewise, when, the, when a command is in progress, uh, the, the planner could come in and say, well, I want you to cancel this one, and that's where uh, the plant would come back and say, okay, cancelled or whatever. And while, also while the system is going on, uh, uh, the plant has an opportunity to send uh, status updates. Uh, so for example, if you might have a, uh, a big file transfer going on from point A to point B, and you don't have enough bandwidth, you would want to know how long will it take. And so that's where the support for uh, status updates comes in and observations, as Paul talked about, uh, is for sending observations about itself to the planner. Uh, I'll skip this part, but this is the definition of the plant interface in Clojure, and we have implementations uh, for the plants, and uh, you could implement it in any language, but I hope you will implement uh, your plants in Clojure. I'll say. Okay, those of you who are with us um, at Clojure, um, West, um, I gave an example of modeling the simple circuit with a, a power supply, a, a controllable power supply and a light with a light sensor. Um, since then, we've uh, built a physical instantiation of this using a Raspberry Pi 3. It's here with us today in this box and uh, we, can, uh, we can see it in operation and you can see the uh, back and forth of messages between the plant and the running Pamela program. So, with that, you go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so what you're seeing here is the physical plant in the lower left, and in the uh, upper left is the hierarchical task network that was defined in Pamela, and then Pamela built the hierarchical task network uh, file as JSON or Eden, and the temporal planning network, which is in the upper right. Uh, and now in the lower right, you see the dispatcher dispatching the events over RabbitMQ, and the uh, physical plant is listening to those events, the commands, for example, to turn on and turn off, and then the plant is also sending its observations to RabbitMQ, and that is being um, monitored by the system. Uh, so Pamela is used to actually generate the plans, and what you see in the top is uh, two instances of plan viz, which is our closure script application to actually visualize hierarchical task networks and temporal planning networks. And uh, this is uh, a, a lot of fun because it's allowed us to take the modeling language uh, that we've designed uh, in closure and actually use closure tools uh, on the back end as well as on the front end. And uh, because our interface is abstracted through uh, RabbitMQ, uh, it, you know, the language on the other side in the plant is completely uh, independent of this and, and can, uh, can respond accordingly. Uh, so, uh, Paul, I think you said that you were thinking about uh, publishing the plans for how you constructed this box and the, 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 the software you installed in the Raspberry Pi so people could reproduce this at home. Yeah, we're going to put uh, all the details on the website uh, or um, into the uh, distribution, so those of you who feel inclined to build one can do. Um, so in this, in this example, we were sending commands from the, from the control program to turn the light on and off, but this button here also responds as a normal button would, so we can turn it on, and you can see in the... Uh, where did it go? Yeah, 
Uh, there you go. The, the, uh, the button presses are coming across the uh, RabbitMQ uh, interface, the plant interface. So whether we're turning it on and off manually or whether it's being controlled, that information is coming across into the database and we can learn from it. So it's a very simple example, but it's an implementation of the example that we worked through laboriously at Closure West um, at the beginning of the year. And uh, so just a, a couple of words about uh, uh, the open source project. Uh, after listening to Rich's talk last night, I'm, for some reason, I'm less enthusiastic about semantic versioning. Um, one thing that Rich didn't mention about semantic versioning is the importance of the major version going from zero to one. You know, in zero, you know, it's, it's considered okay that the API is changing because it's not solid yet, and then 1.0, uh, it, you know, then, then you have an API, and then two, you're, you're breaking the world, and that's bad. So I'm especially sensitive about not breaking anyone with, with Pamela. I'm, I'm really excited to say that this is a great project. It's a fun project because it's a DARPA project. We get to code enclosure, and we get to work in the open. So you get to see our work in real time and all the pretty things and maybe not so pretty things. But um, it's available on GitHub under the permissive uh, Apache license, and no contributor agreement is required. Uh, and we're quite enthusiastic about getting uh, support for it. It still is early days for Pamela. For those of you that were at Closure West, uh, we've done some significant changes to the Pamela grammar. In particular, we're now supporting the hierarchical task network representation. Um, we have this sort of idea of, I'm saying in air quotes, macros. Paul showed you a code snippet earlier where to do the machine learning, we were flipping the coin a thousand times. So the, the, the thing that said do times a thousand is sort of a, a Pamela macro. The thing to remember about Pamela as a language is it's a DSL, it's a declarative language to describe a model, it's not an imperative programming language. So that's, that's one important distinction about when, when you're thinking about Pamela. Uh, the parser was re-implemented with Instaparse, and uh, there were a number of things that we did in the UI side with PlanViz to make it better. Uh, in particular, I'm really excited about the fact that we can take the graphs that you saw that are really pretty and rendered in SVG in their browser, and you can export that to SVG to a standalone SVG file. Um, now, uh, we're planning for uh, Q1 next year to do a release which will hit 1.0, very important. We're gonna be very sensitive to your needs. Uh, that will include the details of the plant interface that Prakash described to you. Um, also, uh, we're going to have a, uh, at least one planner, a Monte Carlo temporal planner to go along with it. And uh, uh, belief state estimation module, which was part of the, the larger plant diagram that Paul described, um, and some facility for machine learning. So I think that that's one of the things that sets Pamela apart from other modeling tools like PRISM that you might be familiar with. In PRISM, the developer has to hard code these numbers in, and it's sort of a static thing. Pamela is different in that we want to declare the model without having the domain modeler be an expert in various machine learning algorithms uh, or plant actual designs. And because those things are separate, um, we can actually, and because we have this idea of learning variables, we can run learning on the model and then use the learned values in place of those learning variables the next time that we run without changing the model and without having to you know, hand type them in again. So we'll be around uh, for the conference today. There's actually a Pamela channel in Slack, and you can get us on GitHub, and we're really enthusiastic to talk to you more about Pamela and your thoughts about it and how we can help. So thank you very much. <laughs>